This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. This is my iron. You're going to acknowledge me. Well, guys, the Royal Rumble has come and gone. We now have the answers as to who has won the Royal Rumble for the men and the women. We've got the outcome of the Fatal 4-Way. We've got the outcome of the United States Championship match. Uh, We've got some answers, but it overall seems to. And this is just my, my quick feeling on the show based on everything I've heard from you guys too uh, and from other podcasters and their fans and it felt like most people were underwhelmed with the show most people seem to be disappointed by the show most people feel like something was missing from the show whether it was someone something a a feeling an intangible the crowd was too quiet and I would say there are some and there is some legitimacy to those claims. I think that the show, per me, my view of the show, I tweeted out earlier. I said that it was a good, I thought it was a good show, even if it was predictable. And I'm all about making the right decision in lieu of just doing something shocking that makes no sense just for the sake of shock. We've seen that before under the Vince McMahon regime and under the Hunter, uh, Hunter regime, Triple H regime. There has been more of a sense of uh, PLEs over delivering. Now, there was a dark cloud hanging over the entire show, and that cloud was called Vince McMahon. And that cloud consisted of the lawsuit pending against Vince McMahon from the former employee. We went over that. You guys have heard about it already. And in the post press conference, WWE did a very bad job, I thought, of kind of skimming over it or. Trying to downplay it? I mean, even Triple H, who is usually pretty good at dealing with the media, gave a really just not good answer, saying he didn't read the lawsuit and that he doesn't want to focus on the negatives. There's so many positives. And um, I have to say to Triple H, like, I understand what you're doing. You're trying to divert the attention. And there are some good things to talk about, a lot of good things to talk about from the show. But that's all stuff that is in the sandbox. You know what I mean? It's almost like he was prioritizing a fantasy environment, which is the on-screen stuff with WWE, over the actual real stuff going on with Vince. The real world stuff. The stuff that is always more important than what's on camera. And he wanted to just really dismiss it. I don't want to, that's the negative stuff. I want to focus on the positives. Bad, bad. That just sounds and looks bad. And then telling us he didn't read it. Okay, I maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he's telling the truth. He probably is telling the truth. He didn't read it. But that's still not a good thing. I mean, your, your father-in-law is under, uh, um, under this cloud of a massive civil suit and you are not even bothering to read it? I, I mean, I understand what he's doing. I understand the attention that he wants to divert away from that. Don't, don't look at that. Look, oh, look over here. Look at all this nice stuff. Because he's trying to make the company look as good as possible and just kind of push it aside. But it just still doesn't look good. And it's uh, he, he could have just said, look, it's a pending lawsuit. I can't comment. It's, a, you know, for, for uh, legal reasons, guys, we can't talk about the suit. Uh, if you have questions about tonight and the Royal Rumble itself, I'd be glad to answer them. End of story. That's it. And instead, he actually decided to go a different road, which I thought was a bad call. Uh, a really bad call. But... Um, so I don't know if it was that that made the show feel a bit underwhelming. And I agree. I, again, I thought it was a good show because of the booking decisions. But I didn't think that, the, you know, some of the matches, particularly the men's Royal Rumble, Rumble match, wasn't particularly overwhelming. And maybe to an unfair degree, every year our expectations get raised to a level that's unachievable. And yes, Brock Lesnar did not show up. Braun Breaker is the man who apparently took his spot. And the positioning of Braun made uh, Braun, not Braun, although Braun Strowman, I, I actually thought he was going to appear. Um, you know, when, it look, when you look at Braun Breaker's 
number and where he came in and how dominant he looked, that was apparently supposed to be Brock Lesnar's spot, was Braun Breaker filling in for Brock. So Brock does not make an appearance. We are not going to get a Brock Lesnar and Gunther matchup, it's, it appears, unless something comes out that clears Brock Lesnar's name without question. Uh, Brock Lesnar is off TV indefinitely until things are settled. Uh, and even after that, if things are looking bad for Brock, if he is found guilty or some he's in, he's involved in a way that is, uh, let's say, undesirable, to say the very least, then he probably won't be back on TV ever. So a lot is hanging in the balance with this suit, and that didn't help the Royal Rumble. Brock Lesnar's appearance, I think, would have really helped. Many of us were looking forward to a Gunther-Brock Lesnar interaction, and that didn't happen, obviously. But for Braun Breaker, it's a breakout performance. You know, when when uh, one door closes, another opens, and that door of opportunity opened for Braun Breaker, and I think he made a very nice big splash in the Rumble. I do. I think he, you know, that, that military press of Gunther over his head was incredibly impressive. The crowd reacted fairly well to him. There's a lot of narrative going around again that the crowd was quiet. And at times they were. At times they were, especially during the Women's Royal Rumble. They didn't have a whole lot of um, energy, shall we say. They felt a bit underwhelming at times, quiet. Uh, but they weren't the worst crowd in the world. I'm, I'm hearing over dra- dramatized statements from people that this was one of the worst crowds in the history of PLEs, and I'm, I wouldn't go that far. They weren't. They weren't a... I don't think they added a ton to the show, but they weren't silent. You know, I, I thought they were loud when they, they needed to be. But generally, yeah, their, their energy was down a bit. Yes, I would agree. So that didn't help the show. The absence of Brock Lesnar didn't help the show. The, the, uh, the, the black cloud, as I mentioned, of Vince McMahon's lawsuit definitely did not help the show, uh, which is what everyone was thinking about. Uh, Also in the men's rumble, as we're kind of looking at some of the negatives here, because there are some positives and I got a lot of good stuff to say. Pat McAfee, I love on commentary. I mean, that's not exactly a shocking statement or a controversial statement. A lot of people like him. I do on commentary. He's grown on me. Why would they waste a Royal Rumble spot on Pat McAfee? What did that do for anyone? I understand that that him in the rumble is funny and yeah, like, okay, I get it. He would, he just eliminated himself because he would have gotten his ass kicked, but like, then why even waste a spot that could have gone to an NXT guy or another guy on the roster? You're going to have Pat come in, look like a chicken and, and then, you know, eliminate himself for what that doesn't help anyone. It wasn't funny. Didn't help Pat McAfee in any capacity, and it took a spot away from a guy that would have actually competed. That was a weird waste of a spot. So there's that. And then there's also the returns that underwhelmed a lot of people. Or, to be more specific, the lack of returns that underwhelmed people. Now, that's not to say that people didn't care about Andrade. They absolutely did. Andrade coming in was a big moment. Uh, Coming back after how many? A few years, right? That was a big moment. Um, you know, having him return, the interactions with Santos, all of that was a lot of fun. So Andrade will be a big player moving forward. But oh, and of course Naomi, Naomi. I mean, the, the yeah, by the way, the announcers didn't react the way I thought they would. They were just kind of like, and it's been a long time, and here's Naomi. I feel like they would have should have oversold it a little more, and they were just almost quiet about it uh, initially, anyway. So Naomi was a big return. Really good to see her. And the debut of Jade Cargill was arguably the biggest moment of the entire night. I mean, you could argue it was the biggest moment of the night over all the championship matches and everything else could have been the biggest moment of the night. You could have argued and the crowd reacted appropriately. They were waiting for Jade Cargill. Some of the face offs she had. We'll, we'll get into the women's rumble in a little bit, but uh, yeah, particularly with Bianca Belair, people were just dying for uh, so many different moments with her I mean obviously she didn't win but still Liv Morgan returns but it's it's that big return that big moment that big big thing that didn't happen like Roman losing the belt didn't happen the rock returning or interfering or getting involved in any capacity didn't happen the guys that you thought were going to win or the guy and gal you thought were going to win won, which is fine again it's not a complaint at all but that big goosebump moment never came 
And I think that is what people are really pointing to when they uh, talk about this year's Royal Rumble pay-per-view or PLE is that there was no big, massive goosebump, shocking moment that we all were looking for. And almost maybe unfairly, you know, maybe unfair. Maybe we should stop expecting that. Maybe we should stop expecting WWE to produce those moments every single PLE. But the Royal Rumble is a big PLE. I mean, this is not exactly your, you know, your extreme rules event in the middle of the summer. This is a, you know, one of the big four beloved by fans pay-per-view. So kind of weird that they didn't produce that moment, but I don't know what options they had and they didn't want to do it just to do it. And I, I respect that. So it sounds like a big, big whiny baby complaint about the PLE and it's not, but I do tend to feel while it was a good event and good booking, it lacked that goosebump feeling. It lacked that big feeling. Like you could come away from this PLE and go, oh, yeah, okay. All these uh, decisions made sense, but there wasn't those, th- that, that kind of like awe-inspiring moments. The, none of that didn't occur, which I think is what a lot of us are complaining about unfairly or fairly. So we'll get into all of it in just a minute. But first, after that big, long intro, <laughs> Welcome to the WWE Podcast, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us as we are going to, going to review the 2024 Royal Rumble here in depth. And uh, tomorrow we'll be joined by Anthony DeMarco, who will be joining us for the current state of WWE. I wonder what the heck we're going to talk about. And we are then going to pursue our regular schedule here until the next PLE, which is in, I think, November, not November, February 24th, 25th, something, something like that for the Elimination Chamber event, which is four weeks away. And then after that, it's about five or six weeks until Mania. 69 days as I record this until WrestleMania 40. So that'll go quick as it does every year. It feels like they tell us 70, 80, 90, 100 days. And then you blink and here we are. It's like 10 days away, right? That happens every year. That'll happen this year. But we do have one more pit stop in the Elimination Chamber in Perth. I think a lot's going to happen there. Of course, uh, I, I believe Punk will compete in the Chamber. He'll win his right to face Seth Rollins in the Chamber. To me, that is more than likely what's going to happen. But uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us here on what was a uh, very eventful show. So we're going to talk about a whole lot more. Again, I'd like to invite you guys to the ad-free version of this show. If you've listened to the show and you're, you're already saying to yourself, man, I wish I just wish those ads were gone. Well, you can make that happen over at Patreon.com slash WWE podcast, or you can go to uh, Apple Podcasts and become a subscriber. Over there, you get a seven-day free trial. Both places get a seven-day free trial, uh, and you also get exclusive access to our After Dark show. Uh, if you go up to the NXT Plus and above on Patreon, or just become a subscriber on Apple, you get that ad-free access as well as the exclusive After Dark show that is every single week. It's an adult version of the show is, is really what it is, and usually wrestling-based, so check that out. It's, it's, it's an exclusive show to you. So, all right. Let's let's get into the details, guys. Let's let's dive right in to the results here. And it opened with the Royal Rumble and uh, the Women's Royal Rumble. And again, it it, it started honestly kind of it started hot. OK, let me let's just be straight with you. It started hot. It started really fun with Naomi's return. I was a bit underwhelmed with the reaction from the announcers at the beginning of, of uh, her return. Uh, it, it was what? A year and a half, nearly two years since she was back in WWE, May of 2022. <clears throat> so nearly two years. Naomi back was a nice hot start to the Rumble. I had no issue with it. I was, I, I mean, it was a, a kind of a, a set the tone type of return that I hoped would be the case. And really throughout the Women's Royal Rumble, I was not exactly impressed until Jade Cargill came out or really Becky Lynch. And, um, Number one, by the way, was who was it? Who was it? Uh, no, Natalia. And Natalia, who was eliminated eventually by Tegan Knox. But Naomi came out and big return. She had a big showing. Uh, nice to see her back. I, I have absolutely no issue with this. The women's division needs a little bit of a boost. And Naomi had a nice showing. Um, and uh, she was eventually eliminated by Jade, uh, Jade Cargill, by the way. We'll get to Jade. We then got Bailey. At number three, who, of course, we all know went the distance, Candice LeRae, Jordan, uh, Jordan Grace. I thought it was Jordana. <laughs> it's it's Jordan Grace. A, she's the current TNA knockout champion. Very interesting here. Um, You know, it's this is the first time that I can recall 
um, in which the TNA champion, anyway, was involved in the actual Royal Rumble. I think we've seen a little bit of a crossover before, but nothing like this, where she actually had a hell of a showing here. Uh, Jordan Grace was, uh, you know, one of the standouts up until, of course, we got the bigger names here uh, with Bianca Belair and uh, yeah, the other uh, the other woman. I mean, Tiffany uh, Stratton eventually came out and she had a nice showing, too. But Jordan Grace really was the first one that you looked at and went, wow. Right. And most of us who watch WWE have never seen her before. Most of us don't even know the name Jordan Grace. And so it was a nice showing for her. The crowd reacted pretty well to her. She is a powerhouse woman. And it was cool to see a bit of a crossover. So she was eventually eliminated by Bianca Belair, but she had a hell of a night, uh, no doubt about it, if she ever does come to WWE and do her thing. Indy Hartwell was next. She was eliminated by Bailey. Asuka was eliminated by Caden Carter and Katana Chance. We then had Ivy Nile and Katana Chance come out 8-9. and nine. Bianca Belair was number 10. And she was eventually eliminated by Tiffany Stratton, by the way. Kyrie Sane, who gets almost no reaction, which is a shame lately, came out at 11. Tegan Knox at 12. Caden Carter at 13. Chelsea Green and Piper Niven. Now, here's one of the bigger bright spots of the show uh, for me. Beyond the Jade Cargill, which was clearly the biggest star moment of the night, it was Chelsea Green, the unsung hero of this match, who just kept getting ragdolled and somehow staying in the match. She, when she got eliminated by a Becky Lynch eventually, I, I mean... I, I was disappointed when she did. She is entertaining as hell. I mean, Chelsea Green is just so good at what she does, being that annoying kind of that just, you know, uh, obnoxious character that runs her mouth and obviously can't back it up, but then will gloat about some ridiculous statistic. Uh, For example, she was the fastest eliminated from last year's Royal Rumble at five seconds. And then somehow she said she made history, right? So she turns it into some obnoxious kind of flex. And I enjoyed Chelsea Green. She just kept getting squashed in the corner by Piper Niven or Nia Jax. It was just a lot of fun. And seeing her eventually get eliminated was kind of sad. I was hoping she'd somehow just luck her way into the end of the match. But Chelsea Green was a, really no one's talking about it, but I, I enjoyed Chelsea Green in the match a lot. Um, now, this match up to this point, uh, number 15 was Piper and Evan. So we're about halfway through the Rumble now. It was kind of clunky. Um, a lot of botches. And especially by the time Nia Jax came out, a lot of botches. Um, a, a lot of missed spots and the rumble's not an easy match to, na- to navigate. Most women haven't been in a Royal rumble match. There's only been what six of them on top of it. So I get it, but it was kind of a sloppy uh, middle of the match here. One that was the kind of took the crowd out of it. The announcers trying to cover for them. I, I mean, it happens, but it was un- uncomfortable to watch at times. So then we get to uh, number 16, Xia Li. She didn't have her lightning coming out of her arms and legs, so I think that's probably why she didn't win here. I didn't see any come out of her. Usually on her entrance, she's able, able to uh, you know, produce some kind of electricity from her, from her limbs, and I didn't see any, so she must have not had her power crystals activated, which is why she didn't win the match. So uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, you know, She'll have to check with Zordon. That's a Power Ranger reference for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, then we got Z- uh, Zelina Vega, who had a nice showing. Zelina Vega, she was eventually eliminated by Shayna Baszler, but Zelina Vega also is somebody that I en- I enjoyed the showing she had. She had uh, she came in, hit a Meteora right away. I think that she had a nice showing. Um, now, she didn't make it as deep as I was hoping that she would make it, but she kind of settled things down for me. Uh, seeing her come out, and I, I you know, I'm, as you guys know, I'm a big Zelina Vega fan, so that was nice. Maxine Dupree coming out, I think she had a pretty bad botch, or maybe no, was it after the reverse caterpillar? I'm not sure, but Maxine Dupree, uh, the crowd was with her, you know, the, the, the crowd reacted to her pretty decently, and then we get Nia Jax, who was eventually eliminated by Chade Cargill here, but. Number 19 was Nia Jax. We all knew what she was going to do in the Rumble, just be a force to be reckoned with. Shotzi comes out in her ridiculous Power Wheels tank, uh, which needs to just be destroyed. Becky Lynch. Now we're getting serious, right? Becky Lynch comes out at number 21. She was eventually eliminated by Jade Cargill, by the way. Becky Lynch 
let me just say this, was probably the biggest disappointment of the entire night. And I understand she made it deep into the match, but she's number 21, so that's not exactly impressive. But also, she got her ass kicked 98% of the time she was in the match. Outside of the first moments she came in, which is what every single entrant on the men's and women's side does, when the second they come in, they just start kicking ass, right? And then within 10 seconds, somebody knocks them down. That's just what happens. It's just the way everyone enters the Rumble. Outside of that flurry that everyone gets upon the entry of the match, she did nothing. Absolutely nothing. And this isn't a slight on Becky. This is a slight on the way she was booked here. It was, I mean... I don't want to say awful, but it was very surprising is maybe the word. Disappointing if you're a Becky Lynch fan. Becky Lynch did essentially nothing in this match. She just got her ass kicked time after time after. She spent, I'm not kidding you. If someone was to do a percentage, 98 may be a bit of an over-dramatization, I understand. Probably about 80% of the time, realistically, she was getting her ass kicked laying on the ground, getting stomped in the quarter, getting splashed, getting hit with a finish. She did nothing in this match, and that was very surprising. And and Becky Lynch, it was was unbelievable, really. So that was a big surprise for me, was Becky Lynch having essentially no say at all. Alba Fire then came out, and uh, Valhalla, who was eliminated by Nia Jax in five seconds. R-Truth had some something to say here oddly he thought he was in the men's rumble which was i mean anything our truth does is funny um he was confused and nia Jax just threw him out meechin comes in and she was eliminated by nia Jax. but meechin i don't want to overlook her here she looked more intense than i've ever seen her look she looked better than i've ever seen her look in this moment while she didn't last long it was still something that i do remember with meechin having some kind of offense uh, and it was somewhat memorable for Meechin, the most important mo- match of her career, given that she doesn't ever have a match. So Zoe Stark came out, and then Roxanne Perez had a nice showing as well. She was eliminated by Chip- Tiffany Stratton. And then uh, Jade Cargill finally comes out. Biggest pop of the night for the women, and arguably a top five pop of the night overall, maybe higher. <clears throat> the crowd lost it for Jade Cargill. She does look like an absolute star. She absolutely has the look. I mean, we all knew that, but even seeing her for the first time live, she is. She's. She, I mean, as Corey Graves, I think, put it. I think it was. I think it was Corey. If you were going to create from scratch a women's superstar, you would come out at the other end with Jade Cargill, and that's absolutely true. She has got a look that can really. I think deodorize a lot of the missteps she may eventually have in the ring because she just looks the part so overwhelmingly much that even if she missteps in the ring and doesn't have the five star matches that unfortunately everyone has the expectation of these days, it can be deodorized a little bit with how damn good she looks. And I don't just mean like, oh my God, I'm drooling because she's got such a nice physique. It's, you know, it's beyond that. Of course, I mean, as a man, I'm not blind. But also, it's it's not that necessarily. It's just that she looks like she should be on the poster of everything without even say, saying a word. And I don't know a whole lot about her pro, uh, promo skills. I will, you know, that'll be remain to be seen here. But she just unbelievably, it, it's, it's really insane how just star studded she just looks, which is going to help her moving forward. But the crowd reacted, I mean, exploded for Jade Cargill. And, um, you know, we all knew it was going to happen here. A, a couple of face offs. She uh, did take Nia Jax. She did. I don't know if she was a botch, but she did the best she could to lift Nia Jax up, who, if I was going to guess her weight would be, you know, north of well north of 200. I, I would say Jay, um, Nia Jax is like 220, 230, 230. I'd say Nia Jax is 230 pounds, maybe more. Uh, and if that's the case, you know, her deadlifting a 230 plus pound woman is pretty damn impressive. Um, And doing what she did, putting her over the top rope. I mean, that's what Kane did to the big show back in the day, if you remember. It's kind of like that. And uh, that was impressive as hell. Uh, Lifting her up like, you know, nothing on her shoulders. It It was crazy. And then Tiffany Stratton comes out at number 29. She was eliminated by Bianca Belair. 
and Liv Morgan comes out at number 30. So the only thing here is, uh, you know, we didn't get any AJ Lee, no AJ Lee. I forgot to even mention her in the preview show. No AJ Lee, which was a bit disappointing. I thought she would make an appearance given that we saw her working out in the ring and doing maneuvers in the ring. Eventually, I think what we'll get is a eventually maybe for a one off a uh, CM Punk and AJ Lee versus Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins. I think that matchup could happen maybe at Backlash or at SummerSlam, but that matchup is ready and set to go. You know, that would be a, an amazing matchup. But um, the other thing is the face off with Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair, which even Corey Graves alluded to the fact that the fans have wanted to see that since we heard that the moment Jade Cargill was a sign that we wanted to see that they had a stare off. They were interrupted. Of course, they didn't have any exchange physically, but Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill just from a just from a visual standpoint is going to be uh, I mean, next next level. And now how they work together physically in the ring remains to be seen. Jade Cargill overall physically, I thought, did a nice job. I don't think she was um, too nervous, or if she was, she didn't show it. She certainly covered it well. Um, she's very proud of her physique. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Uh, she's extremely proud of how she looks. She will let you know it. And, you know, if you just you just click by her uh, her profile on any any social media uh, platform, and you will be very quickly, you'll, you'll very quickly realize how proud of herself she is, which was going to lend her, lend itself to be very nice when she's a heel. All right. When she be eventually turns a heel, which yeah, I don't know when that's going to happen, but Jade Cargill is essentially a heel. When you think about it, she's so proud of herself. It's kind of obnoxious, but right now she is a baby face and let's ride it out and see how far that can go. And there, they did tease a lot of potential matchups, matchups with Jade. And uh, many are proposing Jade versus Nia Jax at WrestleMania. So we'll see. Jade doesn't seem to be fitting in the title picture right now. But uh, Liv Morgan got a decent reaction for her return. Uh, I wasn't overly impressed by Liv. Uh, again, I think the letdown. The, 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 the thing is, the letdown for the number 30 spot is almost a given every year. Because the 30 spot has been really just unfairly raised to a level that's almost unachievable every year. I mean, to be honest, I was hoping for AJ Lee for number 30. Obviously that didn't happen. Or many people thought Sasha Banks would be number 30. That obviously didn't happen. So when you look at AJ Lee and Sasha Banks and you get Liv Morgan, it's like, oh, okay, cool. You're back. We won't boo you, but you're not exactly who we were looking for. I mean, that's the way the fans reacted as well. Number 30, if you're not a superstar, superstar, you're going to be a bit disappointed in the reaction you get because fans have an expectation for that number 30 spot for better or worse. That's just the way it is. You can love it or hate it. The fans expect a big star to be number 30. It's just the way it is. So overall, I thought the women's rumble was, was good. Jade Cargill, clearly the standout star of the match. Um, Bailey winning made absolute sense. Now, Bailey has alluded to, sh to the fact that she's going to face Rhea Ripley. If that's true and she doesn't go after um, EO Sky, I'll, I'll be very surprised. That'd be kind of a weird thing to do because where does that leave Becky? You know, like, where, where, where is she going? It's going to be a very weird WrestleMania if Bailey and Rhea. No one's asking for Bailey and Rhea, by the way. No one wants Bailey Rhea. Bailey, the fans are ready to cheer Bailey, but they're also ready to cheer Rhea Ripley. I, I don't think anyone wants that. People would readily cheer EO, uh, boo EO Sky and cheer Bailey. That's a built in story that's been going on for a year and a half. So to me, it's a no brainer that Bailey's going to change her mind and go after EO. I would hope Bailey and Rhea just don't make sense. Not at this juncture. So. That's still slated for a Becky Lynch, uh, I think, a Becky Lynch and Rhea Ripley matchup, I would think. But the uh, chamber is going to really set things in motion. So, all righty. What happened after that? Next, we weirdly got the fatal four-way for the Undisputed Universal Championship here with Roman, Randy, AJ, and LA Knight. This, when I heard that this was coming up next, I thought to myself, well, there is exactly now, without you know, over exaggerating, exactly a zero percent chance that Roman Reigns loses. Because if you guys remember my preview show, I said 
the positioning of this match at the Rumble will dictate if Roman loses or not, or at least there's an elevated risk of him losing. I thought it would at least go on third or fourth. It was either going to be the men's Rumble or this match main eventing. This match went on second. When's the last time a Roman Reigns title match went on second on the show? It, it, so that told me immediately there is no chance of Roman losing. And to double down on it, there is n- almost no chance of The Rock showing up either. And neither of those, thing, those things happened. It was a standard by the numbers Roman Reigns victory. And some people are claiming, by the way, that it's a clean Roman Reigns victory. Some people are telling me, like, did you watch the match I watched? What do you mean a clean Roman Reigns victory? It's the same formula we've been getting for Roman Reigns' title defenses for the last three years. <laughs> we get an interference from the bloodline, which costs Roman or costs uh, his opponent the uh, opportunity to, to win the title. Roman Reigns hits a spear, and that's it. It's the same thing we've been watching for years now. And let me just say something, Okay. First of all, I, the match was fine. It was good. It was really, it was, it was good. It, I enjoyed it. I didn't hate the match. I just hated the positioning, which completely gave away the finish. All four men did an incredible job. There was moments during the match that I said, oh, maybe, right? AJ Styles nearly killing Roman Reigns, by the way, on the Styles Clash. He barely got him up. I said, oh, God. You know, I was like, don't break his neck. That scared me. But the RKOs, when Roman was hit with the RKO, I said, oh, God, here we go. Maybe. And then here comes Solo Sokoa. And then da, 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 same thing, Small and Spike. How many times are we going to see this? Um, LA Knight, by the way, WWE did a really nice job out of nowhere reminding us how big of a star LA Knight is, who has kind of fallen off in recent months with the, all the other big returns with Orton and Punk. Um, WWE has done a nice job of repositioning him, him as a real threat. And they really seem to focus on him before the match and the promo package of doing a nice job of reminding us how big of a star he is and how he has a real chance of winning. So that was a nice, unexpected boost for L.A. Knight that I think his career needed. And the crowd seemed to be really behind him, too. I I mean, they were really behind him, even maybe more so than Orton. Uh, People knew AJ Styles wasn't going to win. But when you look at this match... Okay, you had the solo interference. You had all that. But what I want to talk about is Michael Cole, who responded to the internet wrestling community when the match was just beginning. I think Roman Reigns was making his entrance and doing his thing for 45 minutes. Michael Cole responded to the internet community, internet wrestling community, the IWC, by saying that some believe that, you know, uh, that his match or his um, title reign is... Uh, it's not deserving because he doesn't defend the title every week. That was his words. His words were that we're mad because he doesn't defend the title every week and that he only defends it every uh, couple of months. And that his response was, if you don't like it, then someone should beat him. That was his response. Michael Cole, that is okay. on, on, On several levels, that is a very weak argument. Number one, the premise that we're asking, the premise that you have laid out, that we are asking Roman Reigns to defend the belt every week, is false. No one is asking Roman Reigns to defend the belt every week. No one. I don't want that. We see it with Seth Rollins, and a lot of fans don't like it. Seth Rollins over over defends the championship. There, there's nobody asking for Roman Reigns to defend the belt every single week. No one. So first of all, that's false. Yes, he defends it every every couple of months. I would argue he defend he defended it once in four months over the over uh, twenty twenty three. There was like a four month gap between uh, WrestleMania and SummerSlam. I mean that was egregious. So yeah. Um, also, if you want, if your argument of well, someone should then beat him. Um, well, here's the problem, Cole. He doesn't effing show up. Okay. He has been, he's negotiated a contract, which I have congratulated him for, and I have no fault against Roman Reigns himself. He has made himself a hell of a living. He has set for the rest of his life. He's set his uh, family's life, hopefully for generations to come with all the money he's making. He's preserving his body with the schedule he has. And Good for him. Good for Joe. Good for Joe Aniwai. Good for him. But for fans, 
the Roman Reigns character doesn't ever show the F up. So tell me, Cole, how are we supposed to have someone beat him if he can't, if he doesn't show up? And by the way, we have had several candidates over the years, namely Drew McIntyre, Sami Zayn, hell, even Kevin Owens, uh, compete with him, of which we have said, this is our guy. This is LA Knight, another more recent example. Those are the guys that we have told WWE, no, 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 it's time to end it with this guy. And WWE has said, no. Okay. So how exactly are we supposed to have someone beat him when we have told you who we want to beat him and then WWE management refuses to comply? And I still look back at all of those title defenses, specifically Sami Zayn, specifically uh, uh, LA Knight, who have been a really good candidate. And those still would have been really good candidates. And I still believe that they should have, one of them should have taken the belt from Roman. But instead, WWE refuses. So Cole, the argument of responding to us that, oh, well, his, you know, you're, we're complaining that he's never defending the belt. He's not even there to defend it. So let's start at baseline. Cole, you're wrong on like four levels. And no one's asking him to defend it every week. I love you, Cole. I really do. I, I, your commentary is an anchor on the show. When you're not on the show, it is. I, I, I really enjoy it. But you're wrong. Just on the premise of the argument, you're wrong. All right. So I really, when he said that, I'm just like, what are you talking about? Can you, I'd love to have him go on a show or anyone who's in management come on the show and actually have like a debate about why you're doing what you're doing and how you feel. It's a, the best for the company to keep a belt on a, on a champion that's absentee and has been absentee for so many years at this point. Explain the benefits of that. Explain how not giving guys an opportunity regularly, not every four months, an opportunity to potentially win a championship and not allowing guys to get in the ring with Roman Reigns regularly once a month to tell me that that's worth it all after all these years. And then tell us at the same time that Roman Reigns is the greatest champion of all time when he has been there a very small fraction of the time and then go these large chunks of time, these large gaps in his apps in, in his reign where he goes two, three months, he's just missing. And that adds like 100 days automatically to his run. And we're supposed to be impressed by the number of days he's been champion when he takes like, you know, multi-month vacations. How is that impressive exactly? And his matches, you know, I tweeted this out too, and I'll stand by it. And then I'll move on, I promise. I'm going to move on to the uh, uh, U.S. title match. The... Uh, the Roman Reigns matches on on really some level have become boring. And I don't mean that from an effort perspective. I don't mean that in the near fall fun or that the guys just don't care or they're not trying to put on a good show or they're putting their bodies through hell. No, 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 no. All of that's true. But at the same time, it can also be true that his matches have become boring because they are so predictable and formulaic where you know he's going to be in jeopardy. He's, somebody hits a finish on him. You know that the, there would be a three count. And then here comes the bloodline. Here comes Solo. Here comes Jimmy. Oh, wait, never mind. Distraction, Samoan Spike, Spear. There it is. Game over. It's the same effing formula. That's why they can also be really good matches and boring at the same time. Those two can happen at the same time. And that is where the, where the Roman Reigns matches have become and where they are now. They're boring, but also I can appreciate the hell out of the effort. It's a very strange combination. I'm just sick of going into Roman Reigns matches and immediately knowing the outcome. I'm sick of it. The fans are sick of it. This isn't the heat on Roman. This is the heat on the company. This is the heat on Roman is and was on him because as a character in a good way, the heat now has transferred to the company and has been on the company for over a year now, I would argue maybe longer. The heat is on the company for continuing to push this for some God known unknown reason. Is it just for Cody? Is it really? I mean, we'll get to him in a minute, but I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. Overall, it was a, it was a good match. I applaud all four men, including Roman. Uh, the timing was there. It was a very sound wrestling match. Some fun near falls that made you wonder. But ultimately, it's the same match we've been watching. You can just plug and play this formula that we saw last night to any of the matches he's had, nearly any 
of the matches he's had over the last couple of years and go, oh, let me guess. Solo interfered. Roman Reigns got lucky. Uh, Jimmy came out. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they did, right? Yeah, Jimmy wasn't there, but Solo was the one that helped him retain at WrestleMania, helped him retain last night, among other times, right? (sighs) Okay, I'll get off this match and get into the United States Championship match, which this was a lot of fun. And love or hate Logan Paul, every time he gets in the ring, he kicks his own ass. He does not leave anything to be desired. He, as I've mentioned, doesn't deserve to be this good. And he is a lot of fun near falls. The bumps that they took were just, I mean, Logan Paul was bleeding at one point. Um, this, this was just a blast of a match and I knew it was going to be, but it even exceeded my expectations. Um, Logan Paul never hit a stunner. I don't think by the way, which was interesting. The finish was that Logan Paul had his crony come out, try to give him the knucks. The referee stopped him. Uh, eventually we had KO get a hold of the knucks hit Logan Paul, knocked out Logan Paul, but the referee saw the knucks on, um, Owens as he was making the cover and the referee called for the DQ and Owens ends up losing the match via DQ, which allows Logan Paul to remain the United States champion. Uh, We had Grayson Waller and Austin Theory come out and and get themselves involved. Um, But then we got after the match, we got Owens continuing to attack Logan Paul, sending him through the announcer's table. And this this program is going to continue, which is which is fine with me. And it should still be to me, L.A. Knight taking the belt off of Logan Paul at WrestleMania. So I had no issue with this. This was the absolute right booking. Uh, All of them, and by the way, again, all matches, all four matches at the Rumble were booked properly. They were the 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 winners and losers. I think were booked properly. I really do. All of them. Um, And this one, just you could argue this was match of the night. You could. This was just a again all four men or or both men rather did a really nice job, and uh, Logan Paul continues to just kill it inside the ring. So. No issues here with the finish and uh, some nice near falls. And um, this this program is going to continue. All right. Let's get to the men's Royal Rumble match. The first guy out, Jey Uso. He was eventually eliminated by Gunther. We then got Jimmy Uso coming out. And he was eventually eliminated by Braun Breaker. But more importantly than that, Jimmy Uso staring at Jey Uso. uh, Jimmy needs to chill on the body language (laughs) his facials were a complete overreaction to jay he's i mean he had his eyes wide at him i don't know if he was trying to make him laugh or he was trying to actually emit some kind of craziness or he was supposed to be scared or it was to me just whatever the intention was it still to me came off goofy the wide-eyed stare at jay was just overdone it felt like he knew the camera was on him, zoomed in, and he was trying to overcompensate for that. I, I, I didn't like it. <laughs> but Jimmy and Jay facing off, given the history, was fun. We haven't seen it in a while. And I don't know if this is a precursor for these two facing each other at WrestleMania. I still believe that Jey Uso should win the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania. So I don't, I'd, if, if I was given a choice, I'd rather have Jay versus Gunther in, in, in the IC title picture at uh, Royal Rumble or at. Um, rather WrestleMania than Jimmy versus Jay. I, I really still don't care about Jimmy versus Jay. We, I'm done with the civil war stuff. I, I don't even care. Uh, I, I know some of you do, and that's great. Uh, I, I just, to me, I'd rather have Jay win an actual championship than beat his brother. So just my thought. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Grayson Waller came out next. Andrade, number four, Andrade returns. He, he's been gone for what, three years plus? And it was nice to see him back. He was eventually eliminated by uh, Bronson Reed, but Andrade back was an expected return in in a lot of ways, but still cool to see him back. He looks like he's more polished, more confident. I I mean, uh, got a good pop as well. So Andrade coming out was a nice, uh, a nice return. Carmelo Hayes was next. Shinsuke Nakamura, who was eventually eliminated by Cody, came out. Santos Escobar, who was eliminated by Carlito, was out next. Karrion Cross 
was next. He was eliminated by Bobby Lashley, so that program continues. Dominic Mysterio was number nine. He was eventually eliminated by Punk. Carlito came out at number 10. Bobby Lashley came out at number 11. Ludwig Kaiser was number 12. Austin Theory was number 13. Finn Balor was number 14. Cody Rhodes cut his number in half from last year. He's number 15. Bronson Reed was 16. Kofi Kingston was 17. Gunther was 18. Ivar was 19. Number 20 should have been Brock Lesnar, but it's Braun Breaker. He was eventually eliminated by Dominic Mysterio. And again, Braun Breaker had a nice showing here. Uh, Really nice showing with uh, some of the spots and getting himself some exposure to the main audience that may not have seen him in a while or really know kind of who and what he is. So, yeah, it was a big loss for a lot of people angry that Brock didn't show up given the pending lawsuit with Vince that names Brock, which is not good for either man, obviously. But Braun Breaker here, I think, really capitalized on that opportunity that was lost by Brock Lesnar. Uh, And it was the right by, by the way, the right call that you don't put Brock out there. You you just can't with all the sponsorships, because if you guys didn't know, Slim Jim, who paid millions to be on the show last night and all their their, their ad spots and everything else, uh, <clears throat> they were pulling out of the sponsorship deal until Vince resigned. Once Vince resigned, they went back into the deal and they uh, decided to move forward with the partnership for the Royal Rumble with WWE. Um, if Brock Lesnar had come out, I think that would have been a big issue with sponsors. Again, you guys got to think about that as, as fans, we don't really care who cares about the sponsors to WWE. That's a major source of income is the sponsorships major, if not their primary source of income, even more than the fans and the merch sales and the ticket sales and everything else. We are a big source too, but the sponsorships supersede us. So they give a damn about what the sponsors say. And it was just the right call on top of the fact that it's just the right thing to do. So, which sucks if you wanted to see Brock and you wanted to see Brock and Gunther interact here. Well, you can thank uh, his actions, uh, for unfortunately, if they're true. Omos was number 21, who was eventually eliminated by Braun Breaker. Omos coming back. I'm, I mean, did anyone really care that much? I, uh, nah. <laughs> he had a cool face off with Braun Breaker, which was going to be Brock. But we've seen Brock and and uh, Omas before facing against each other, so that wouldn't have been that big of a deal. Um, but Omas facing off against uh, Braun was it was a fun little new you know, interaction. Pat McAfee was number twenty two. He eliminated himself in thirty eight seconds. Again, a totally wasted spot that helped no one. J D McDonough was eliminated by Jey Uso. We then had our Truth come out, and he thought it was a tag match, which was hilarious. So. He- He's on the on the rope. He was Dominic played along and tagged in Truth. That was hilarious. I mean, I wish Truth made it to the final four. I mean, how do they not have this man eventually as a champion? Just a quick three month run. Have some fun. Give him, you know, reward him instead of just being a comedy character, which he's very successful at. I would love something a little more serious for Truth. The Miz was number twenty five. Damian Priest was number twenty six. CM Punk, number 27. Number 28 was Ricochet. Number 29 was Drew. And number 30, Sami Zayn. So, no Hulk Hogan, thank God. Sami Zayn was back. He just went right after Drew McIntyre. He had a haluva kick on Drew McIntyre, but he was eventually eliminated by Drew McIntyre. So, Sami Zayn and Drew are probably going to go right into her. They're going to continue where they left off from the program from a couple months ago and go right on to Raw and, and uh, face one another. And maybe you could bring Jey Uso and Gunther into this too and have that fatal four-way I keep imagining in my mind for the IC title. And Sami Zayn had a nice reaction. Again, um, I don't think it was an ex- as explosive as, you know, uh, you know, maybe The Rock, which a lot of people thought was going to happen. And it didn't. So Sami Zayn ends up, uh, you know, having a nice showing but he was really there just to continue his program with Drew. Drew had a nice showing as well, uh, but it, it came down to, I think it was, was it Cody, Punk, and uh, Seth, or Seth, Cody, Punk, and uh, Drew, and it was the men that you thought would be there that were there, <clears throat> and it came down to eventually Cody and Punk. They had a really nice showing together 
a really fun kind of finish for finish who can throw each other out some you know very intricate um close eliminations that eventually did end in Cody Rhodes beating Punk as we all know now and I thought Cody would win to me this is the right call again you could have Punk win at Chamber and eventually face Seth Rollins that's probably what's going to be on the line at Elimination Chamber is who's going to face Seth at WrestleMania and Punk will win the Chamber and face uh, Rollins at WrestleMania that to me is very clear and has been clear for a month now which is fine because now uh, you have Cody Rhodes, who has won back-to-back Rumbles, and if you guys have been paying attention, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean that in, like, if you really have. WWE had started pushing this um, this narrative that, or this really reminder to fans, the moment that Cody Rhodes declared for the Rumble, which was, like, the day after Survivor Series, hey, don't forget, um, if Cody was to win, the last guy to do that is Stone Cold Steve Austin to win back-to-back Rumbles. Now, of course, Hogan and Sean have done it before, but they wanted to remind you that it's been, uh, I think, by the way, Cole said 26 years. Where's that math coming from? (laughs) Cole was off his game a little bit last night. I mean, he was stumbling through ad reads. Uh, his attack on the IWC had, I mean, I just destroyed his argument there with Roman's complaints and all that. And then he says it's been 26 years. And he said that a couple times. And I'm like, Austin won in 2001. Is it 2027? I- am I in a, in a time warp? Did I get in the DeLorean? Like, what was what he talking about? And he, I'm like, nah, brah. It's like been 23 years. You know, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And the, even Corey Graves repeated the 26. It's a small misstep. I understand, but he repeated it over and over. I'm like, where is this 26 coming from? Anyway, um, nonetheless, they, they were pushing that very early on when, when uh, Cody Rhodes declared himself for the Rumble right after Survivor Series a couple months ago. Hey, don't forget, the last person to do this was Stone Cold Steve Austin. And then it kept getting ramped up every week, every week. They'd remind us to try to equate what Cody's about to do to Stone Cold Steve Austin's accomplishments. And which is just to me hilarious. And it, it, it will never work on me that. Oh, my God. Wow. He, he's a, he's the equivalent of Austin. Wow. Austin did this. Uh, Cody's done it. Well, is, I guess Cody's the new Austin. And it's just it, it's ridiculous. But I know what they were doing, and I, I'm not faulting them for it. Uh, but you, if you kind of heard that early on, it was a setup to remind you how important and big this would be if Cody were to go back to back. So I thought that was a very, very big kind of uh, tipping or writing on the wall, if you will, that, hey, Cody's going to win here. And when he does, don't forget what we told you about Austin, you know, and I'm sure they'll remind us again on Raw tomorrow night. So. This was, uh, again, I didn't hate the win. I I thought it was probably the right way to get Cody into the main event. So all of you Cody fans that were worried he's not going to be in the Rumble or in the main event of WrestleMania, well, you don't have to worry about it. And after the match, he pointed directly to Roman Reigns, who was in the skybox. Seth was also in his own skybox. That was a nice touch, by the way, different different way to um, a different way to uh, kind of end the show with the champions in the skybox, which was cool. Um. And he pointed right to Roman Reigns. So we don't have to worry or wait, right? We don't have to wait many weeks to figure out a decision. Sometimes they'll string us along on the men's and women's side of like, oh, who's going to choose who? And they go on and on and on and on. And it's like, no, you got to choose what championship you're going after. And it should be, by the way, the championship they're chasing, not the person, but nonetheless. So Cody made it very clear that he's going after Roman. Roman seemed a bit distraught about him having to face Cody again. So we're going to get Cody Roman too. And Cody should be the one to take it off Roman as much as I despise the Cody Rhodes babyface character. And I still do. Mr. Smile everywhere he goes. He wears a suit to and from the bus. He probably wears a suit in the gym. He wears a suit probably to bed. And he's probably got a, you know, a bed suit. He's got like a, you know, a, a, you know, everywhere, everywhere the guy goes, he's got a suit on and it's obnoxious. And he's got a stupid smile on his face everywhere he goes. Cody Rhodes is like, he's trying to be too personable. He's trying to be like too, too much like the common man. He's trying to be too, like, he's trying to be like one of us. Like, just be a fan. Be relatable. And it comes across very kind of pandering. And I, I can't stand it. So, 
Nonetheless, I had to get a little Cody jab in there. He was the right guy to win. And Cody and Punk put on a nice ending to the match, which had a few moments that made you believe Punk could win. And I had uh, no issue with it. No Rock, though. So we don't know where the Rock is going to land, how he's going to get involved with Roman. The, 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 apparently, the reports are saying that, yes, Cody, or rather Rock and Roman is still happening. But unless it's going to happen on night one and Cody and Roman's happening night two, and it's not happening at Chamber, well, then I don't know how the hell it's happening. We, we, the time and places are running out. At least when it comes to between now and Mania. Of course, you could do SummerSlam. You could do WrestleMania 41. Both of those have been floated around. But if you're going to do it between now and WrestleMania 40, <laughs> you've got very limited options here. Um, and also, I know I'm rambling, guys. I've got a lot to say. This has also been a big problem with Roman Reigns' run. Not only does he not show up and he's, you know, he's all that kind of stuff, which is all true and big. It's the biggest problem we have with him. When Roman Reigns goes <clears throat> and wins a, a pay-per-view, wins the main event of the event of the whatever pay-per-view you're at, whatever PLE you're watching and you get the same finish and all that, you immediately look at it, look ahead and you go, OK, well, he's not going to show up to this B pay-per-view which means he's not going to lose it maybe until the next big one, which is in three months, right? So th that's been another problem with Roman Reigns' run is he doesn't, not only does he not defend it at every event, but you can look ahead in chunks of like three months, quarter of years and go, well, he didn't lose it at the Rumble. So now the, he's definitely not losing it at the Chamber. He's not supposed to compete at the Chamber, by the way, either. But then you look at WrestleMania, like, well, <laughs> you know he's going to have a run at least through April 3rd or whatever WrestleMania is this year. So that's also been a big problem with Roman's run is you just look ahead and go, if he doesn't lose it here, he doesn't have another chance of losing it for another three to four months after that at this event. That's been also super frustrating. So you're artificially just pumping in three to four month chunks of time because you know they're not going to drop the belt in a B pay-per-view with Roman. Just wanted to put that out there. Um, but I do want to end on a positive note. The WWE did a nice job at the Women's Rumble also in the fact that they didn't land and lean on the stars of yesteryear, which they've done so much in the past to fill out the 30 women's spots. They didn't, I don't think, did they bring in anyone from yesteryear like a Molly Holly or a Tori Wilson or a Stacey Keebler? They didn't. And I applaud them for that because they did that in years past, especially early on, and it made it just feel so artificial. It made it feel so just weak and like they couldn't fill out the roster so they had to bring in stars to make it look like there was a deep roster of women it was embarrassing so i'm glad they didn't do that this year so that's something positive i wanted to end on but um, when it comes to the rock guys i know no rock no brock um no austin some people were predicting he would somehow show up no i, I mean no <clears throat> um i understand that no aj lee no big moment right there wasn't that big oh my god this is going to be awesome moment i understand that i feel that disappointment i share that with you but also they booked correctly so wwe would say well you didn't get that moment but you got what you said you wanted so what are you complaining about it's a weird feeling right but i guess we want to have our cake and eat it too we want the really good booking that makes sense but we also want those shocking returns we want those shocking moments we want those shocking confrontations and we didn't get any of that this time around. But we still got some nice returns. I'd say nice. Andrade, Liv Morgan. We got the debut of Jade Cargill. We got to see a lot of uh, some some nice uh, moments from Tiffany Stratton, Roxanne Perez, Braun Breaker. We got some really nice NXT uh, talent as well, which I know doesn't create as much buzz. But this is what the lifeblood of the company is, is to help create new stars and get them moving and get them in front of fans. It's not as fun as a, as a fan, established fan, especially if you don't watch NXT. It's not as interesting. It's going eh, to, who cares about these people we don't know, but you will know them. You know, so like it, it, it's hard to kind of convince fans of that sometimes that, yes, they're not the, the big stars, but they might very well be one day. So overall, what do I give the event? Some people ask me that out of 10, six and a half, maybe. Yeah, six and a half is kind of where I've landed. Kind of like, okay, okay to good. Maybe a seven, six and a half to seven out of 10 is where I would land the event. Um, I know many of you are a lot lower. Some of you are in threes, fours, and fives out of 10. 
Uh, six and a half is kind of where I've landed out of 10 because it did what it needed to do, but it didn't live up to the expectations, which is kind of sounds like it's a contrarian statement, but it, it it's not, if you know what I mean. And also the, the looming um, dark cloud of Vince McMahon and Brock not being there because of the whole lawsuit and Triple H handling the press very poorly at the end and telling us to stop talking about it because he just wants to talk about the positives. It's like, no, dude. We're the journalists. We decide what the hell we want to talk about. And this is way more important than whatever's going on on TV. That's all manufactured, by the way. You need to address this if we ask you and stop telling us not to because, oh, it's a negative. I don't want to talk about it. It, How did he not know that that was going to be something that that the journalists immediately ask? And how are you trying to downplay it like it's not more important than the positives of, well, we had a great great event, guys, right? Right? Uh, Talk about the event. Don't talk about that. It was very, uh, I mean, that's that's a very rare misstep for Triple H. He should have had a canned response to cover all his statements so he didn't have to talk about it of like, hey, guys, listen, I know you want to talk about Vince. I know you want to talk about the pending lawsuit. Let me just say right off the bat, for legal reasons, I cannot comment on it. Uh, so if you have any, if you have any questions about the Royal Rumble event itself, I'd be happy to answer it. But uh, at this time, we can't comment on uh, the pending lawsuit with Vince. And he would have shot it dead right there. It would have been a boring canned statement, but better than what he produced. I mean, I'm sorry, Trips. He, you, you didn't exactly handle that the best way. All right. I, it's just it's a rare misstep for him. And there are reports, too, of, oh, well, Triple H is going to be gone soon, too, which I hope isn't true. But all right. Well, that'll do it for my Rumble review. I'm all fired up now. Uh, we've got a really hot Monday Night Raw hopefully coming. We've got, uh, of course, SmackDown on Friday. But in between, we have a lot of content. We've got a lot of co-hosts coming on. We've got uh, Anthony DeMarco tomorrow night, who will obviously will talk about the Rumble. We've got the Raw review. I've got a guest host uh, coming there. I've also got a guest host coming next Sunday night. You guys have heard them before. Brand new co-hosts. I've got Amanda and Chrissy who are coming on this week. So you guys will uh, get some female flavor into the show. Uh, yeah, I think we need it, right? <laughs> we need that softer side. We need that more. Uh, we, we, need, we need that side that's uh, not always not always so uh, negative, which is, uh, I know sometimes we lean on that. But all righty. Thank you so much, guys. If you want to go ad free, Patreon, patreon.com slash WWE podcast, or you can go to Apple podcasts and subscribe there and go ad free there as well. Or WWEpodcast.com. Lots of ways to go ad-free, and I'd recommend you do it during the Rumble season and beyond. So thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the Rumble review, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to WWEpodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.